So I'm going to actually start with the easiest part of the skeletal system, and that's the femur. We're going to start with the leg bones. The leg bones are really big, they're really easy to see. Now, this is where you start to need uh, your lab manual. But if we turn to exercise 10, exercise 10 is the appendicular skeleton, the appendages, the arms and legs. You've got pictures of the femur on figure uh, 10.7. Now, some of you may have lab manuals by different authors. So this is what you're going to be using to help you find these structures. Now, they identify a whole bunch of stuff in these pictures. So what are you responsible for? You are responsible for the terms in the 22-page handout. Big and scary as that is, it's actually less terms than they have in the lab manual. So we're going to begin on page 19 page 19 uh, on the 22-page handout. See, we're going to start with the lower limb, the legs, because these are the easiest, the leg bones. And we say uh, on page 19 in the middle of the page, the bones of your legs are much heavier than their counterparts in your arms because obviously not only do they allow movement, but they also have to hold up the weight of your body your arm bones don't have to support the weight of your body. We don't walk on our arms usually, but we do walk on our legs. The femur, in English, the thigh bone, is the longest and heaviest bone in the body. And so uh, there are femurs around the room. Now, as far as the bones that we're using, most of the bones that are probably on the table are uh, hard uh, medical grade plastic or rubber. And we use these so that if they do happen to drop on the floor, they don't shatter. We do have some real bones. You've got to be really careful with a real bone, because if you drop it on the floor, it just shatter. We just have little pieces of it. Uh, they're, uh, so that's why we tend to use the medical grade quality uh, hard rubber. They hold up better than the real bones, but we do have them. So for every bone, sometimes students say, so like all we have to do is know the names of the bones. Do you know that when I teach Biology 3 Lab, I make my students in Biology 3 Lab learn most of the bones of the body? in biology three. We go way beyond that. We're gonna learn for every bone many, many things about each bone, all right? This is a human anatomy class for future healthcare professionals. Some of you are gonna be physical therapists, occupational therapists, radiology techs. What do you think, all you have to know is it's a femur? <laughs> That's it? I mean, every, there's a lot of people know it's a femur. They could be a radiology tech. No, they can't be. Now, the uh, rounded part of the uh, femur, and this is the rounded parts at the proximal end. I'm going to start using this anatomic jargon that we introduced you to on our first class meeting a week ago. Uh, this is called the head. Now, a head, just like your head, is big and round. So a big rounded part of a bone is called the head of a bone. Uh, there are a whole bunch of terms, and I'll give you a page to look at in these terms in just a moment. So the head articulates. Now the word articulates means it attaches. It attaches to what's called the acetabulum of the pelvis. All right, so here's a pelvis, and so here's the head of the femur, and it pops right into this socket, mm -hmm. right, like that. And this socket is called the acetabulum. All right, and uh, so that fits, and this we'll be learning in the future. This is called ball and socket joint. Now, the head of the femur, we wrote, points medially towards the body. Right? The head of the femur points medially, like that. Not laterally, but medially into the body. Uh, and then uh, I also mentioned the fovea capitis. Now, I'm going to mention this, but I'm not going to test you on it. Uh, as you look at the head of the femur, you'll see a hole, a scar, something there. That actually is called the fovea capitis. What's actually attached right there, where that hole is, is a, a ligament. Ligaments hold bones together. So there is a ligament that attaches there and, it, and also attaches to this socket or acetabulum. And that ligament holds these bones together. That's what holds them in place, not screws, 
but uh, a band that we'll learn more about structurally called a, a, a ligament. And uh, so that's the name of the ligament, which I'm not testing you on, is called the ligamentum capitis. That holds it in place. But uh, what I do want you to know at the bottom is the linea aspera. Now, linea is Latin for line, and aspera means rough. So there is a rough line uh, running along the posterior, which means the back side of this shaft of the bone. So I think uh, you can see kind of a rough line that runs along the back side. And the purpose of all these bumps and ridges is this is where skeletal muscles are attached to the bones. And we're going to have a whole unit on muscles that we'll get to. Uh, that takes us to page 20. And on page 20, still learning about the femur, we wrote, note. Oh my gosh, note. Incidentally, if you lose this 22-page uh, handout, you can download your own copy. It's on linked on my website. On my website, I've got it as a PDF file, so you can download it. Now that you've identified the head of the femur, which faces medially towards the body, and the linea aspera, that line, which is on the back, the posterior side, You've got enough information to tell whether this is a right or a left femur. <clears throat> You'd say, say that again. The head has to be facing the body, and the linea aspera has to be on the back side. Now, for the purposes of learning the bones, you may want to you know, just double check. So you can see, OK, so this goes into the but, uh, pelvis, the acetabulum, and the linea aspera is on the back. But for purposes of the exam, the lab test, you cannot do this. <laughs> Most anatomy teachers on a lab exam, and they put numbers and stuff, and they'll ask right or left. Most anatomy teachers will not allow you to lift the bone off the table. I will let you lift the bone off the table. I will let you turn it in your hands, but the moment you position it on your body, I take your test away from you. Now you might say, well, so all of you guys are mean. Why are you so mean? And I'm gonna explain why. You are never gonna see a bone like this ever again after this class. If you're looking at something like this, that patient is way beyond help. <laughs> the only thing that you are ever going to see after this class is what you see at the back of the room. You're going to see x-rays and CT scans and MRIs. You're never going to see the actual bone. You cannot go and pick that up and turn it and position it on your body. You have to be able to see it as if it was lying flat on a table and understand what it is. Do you follow what I'm saying? You have to be able to turn it in your own mind. You have to be able to understand and recognize what it is. You can't pick it up and position it on your body. So there's a reason for why we're trying to get you ready, because after this introductory prerequisite anatomy class, in your clinical program, everything looks like that. In real life, it is a person working in, as a nurse, as a PA, as an OT, as a PT, as a radiology tech, all you're dealing with are scans or images. So that's why. For the day of the test, you don't pick it up and position it on your body. You can hold it, pick it up, you can hold it in your hands, you can turn it, but that's it. The neck of the femur, now just as we have a head and then it gets narrow, it constricts, and we call that the neck, so similarly, Right below the head of the femur, it narrows, it constricts, and that's called the neck of the femur. And then we wrote something really important. A fracture, and the word fracture means a break. A fracture at the neck of the femur is erroneously, you know what erroneous means? By error, incorrectly called a broken hip. In other words, most of us have heard this expression, a broken hip. And you're thinking, oh, they broke their hip, right? They must have broke this. This is the hip. It, no. A, what people call a broken hip is where it breaks right here at the neck of the femur. That is a, quote, broken hip. 
It is actually a fracture or break in the neck of the femur. It is not the hip or pelvis broken at all. So it's a, a misnomer. The word misnomer means that it's misnamed. Misnamed, misnomer. When somebody breaks this uh, at the neck, so the whole head breaks off, and what they do is they put in, and this is called a hip replacement, they put in what's called a prosthetic head. This is shoved into the shaft, and you see this? This creates an artificial head. And they wire this into the acetabulum or socket of the pelvis. Everybody follow that? So this becomes what's, again, incorrectly called a hip replacement. You're thinking they replaced their pelvis, hip replacement. No, what they replaced is the head of the femur, because it had broken off. Now, uh, what does that look like? So you have an x-ray image. I'm going to try. Uh, this ought to be fun. So you can look at this x-ray right back here. And uh, you can see that in the middle picture, uh, but right here, this is actually showing an x-ray. Can you make this out? Can you see that? So that would be good. Probably people get dizzy watching this. This, thank you very much. This is the hip replacement, or prosthetic head. There it is right there, shown as an x-ray, and then it's wired in. All right, so thank you very much. Incidentally, we are going to be looking at some x-rays, and every x-ray that I put out uh, for you to look at, I have a video of. All right, so there is a video with all of my x-ray images that you can uh, look at. We scroll down here to skeletal system. And uh, right here it says, Professor Fink's video review of x-rays shown in lab. We'll click on this. And you get to listen to Queen <laughs> saying, we are the champions. Or you could just mute it. All right, so these are all the x-rays. You see this x-ray is out there as well. And here's the x-ray of the, quote, his, hip replacement pistol. All right, there it is. We've spoken of uh, the neck. Now, the next term is the greater trochanter of the femur. So when you uh, look uh, at the uh, femur, there are two big bumps. There's this bump right up here called the greater trochanter, and then right below it, a lesser trochanter. <clears throat> and so uh, the purpose, again, are for these bumps is where muscles attach. Now, uh, on a real femur, and most of you have these plastic ones, not the real one, so you can't see this on the uh, plastic, but on a real one, on the back side, the posterior side where the linea aspera is, uh, there's a tiny hole, and that tiny hole is called the nutrient foramen. And uh, the word foramen means hole, and that's where a little blood vessel goes into the bone in real life and enters the marrow cavity. We're going to have more to say about that. So that's called the nutrient for, uh, foramen. And then uh, the uh, medial and lateral condyles of the femur. What are those? At the distal end of the femur, right? We're using this jargon. The head is at the proximal end. You'd say, what's that mean? Closest to your body. At the distal end of the femur, farthest from your body, are two rounded bumps. Those are called the medial and lateral condyles. A condyle is a rounded bump where a bone attaches to another bone. Now, you'll, before I go any further, you'll notice we're getting terms, foramen, condyle, trochanter. All of these have meanings. And you have a list. Now, there is a list in your lab manual. But if you just look in your, if you look in your lecture outline on page E10, this is page E10 in your lecture outline. It says common skeletal, skeletal structure terms, and it has fissure, foramen, neatus, sinus, groove, sulcus, fossa, condyle head, facet, and it goes on and on. Tuberosity, trochanter, crest. And it tells you what these terms mean. They are scientific or anatomic terms and some examples. So yes, you're responsible for knowing what those words mean. You need to know foramen means whole. 
You need to know that uh, what, what a condyle is and a trochanter. So they all have meanings. All right, anyhow, back where we were, so we said there's a medial and lateral condyle. Now, how do you know which one's the medial and which one's the lateral? Here's how you know. The head of the femur, we said, points medially. So if the head is medial, then at the distal end, the rounded bump that's on the, dis uh, uh, that's on the same side as the head at the bottom is the medial condyle. Does that make sense? And the rounded bump on the opposite side from the head at the bottom is the lateral condyle. Now these condyles attach, and you can see this on mine, they attach to this bone right here. This is the femur, this is the tibia, the big thick bone of the lower leg. So what's interesting is that the femur only attaches to the tibia, it does not attach to the fibula. I don't even have the fibula here. If you look on the Mr. Skeleton Man, you know, the fibula, the fibula, the fine bone of the lower leg, is attached to the tibia, but it's not attached to the femur. You can look at it. So it's not what you thought, but that's the way it is. There's a lot of things. You thought a broken hip was a broken hip, but it's not. So, um, all right, so the, both the medial and lateral condyles attach to the proximal end of the tibia. And I, everything I'm saying, I wrote this here. In fact, I point out that while the uh, uh, humerus attaches to both the radius and ulna in the uh, arm, in contrast, the femur only attaches to the tibia, does not attach to both the tibia and fibula. The last structure we've asked you to find on the femur is the intercondylar fossa. Now, inter means between. That prefix, inter, means between. So between the condyles, there's a fossa. What's fossa? Fossa is a depression or a concavity. So when you look at the distal end of the femur, you'll see a big cavity there, right between the two condyles. That's called the intercondylar fossa. It's like a notch. So that's the structures that you should know for the femur. Everything that we're talking about on your lab manual are right here. All right, and then some. They list a lot more stuff than I have. You can take a look at it. So the idea is that if you've got your lab manual and you've got my 22-page handout where I try to explain everything, you've really got the resources you need. Uh, the patella is the kneecap. Uh, when we look at Mr. Skeleton Man, uh, so here's his kneecap. You can fill your own kneecap or patella. And the purpose of the kneecap is to protect the knee joint. All right, on figure uh, 10.8 uh, in the lab manual, it has uh, pictures of the tibia and fibula, the thick bone uh, uh, and the fine bone, TM, tibia is medial, fibula is lateral. The tibial tuberosity. So a tuberosity is a bump, and right at the proximal end of the tibia on the anterior or front side, there is a bump called the tibial tuberosity. Let's feel it on ourselves. If you feel, can you feel your kneecap or patella? About one inch below the bottom of your kneecap, there's a bump. That's the tibial tuberosity. Why is that important? So in other words, all of us have done, heard of that knee jerk reflex, right? So where you tap, why don't you just feel your knee, where you tap is right between the bottom of your kneecap and the tibial tuberosity. And if you feel right in that area where it kind of goes in a little bit, it's kind of concaved, caved in, it's sensitive there, right? Can you tap your, tap your fingers right in that area? It should feel kind of sensitive. On page uh, 21, so in fact we wrote the quadriceps femoris muscle, this is the big muscle of the front of your thigh, inserts, that means it attaches right at the uh, tibial tuberosity. So that's the importance of that tibial tuberosity. That's where this huge muscle on the anterior front of your thigh attaches at the tibial tuberosity. The medial malleolus of the tibia, at the distal end of the tibia, at the distal end, there's a big rounded bump on one side. That's called the medial malleolus. Yeah. 
Now, it's only on one side at the distal end. Let's find it on you. What I'd like you to do is feel the rounded bump on the medial side of your ankle. The medial, not the lateral. Medial side. Medial means towards the midline. So that rounded bump on the medial side of your ankle is the medial malleolus of your tibia. Remember the tibia is medial, the TM bone. So then there's a rounded bump on the lateral side also, isn't there? Feel the rounded bump on the lateral side. That's the lateral malleolus of the fibula. So literally when you feel those rounded bumps, and we've all bumped them, the medial one is the medial malleolus of the tibia. The tibia is the medial bone. And the lateral bump is the lateral malleolus of the fibula. Is, I wrote, note. Now that you've identified the tibiotuberosity, which is on the front, and the medial malleolus, which is obviously on the medial side, you've got enough information to tell whether it's a right or a left tibia. Right? So again, for our purposes, we can Tried, you know, positioning it on our body, but not during the test. About the anterior crest, that's the sharp edge on the front of your tibia. Anterior means front, where uh, you feel that sharp edge of the tibia, right on the front. And the medial and lateral condyles of the tibia are actually at the top end of the tibia, where it articulates with the femur. Also remember that the femur only attaches to the tibia. It does not attach, the femur does not attach to the fibula. Uh, so it is a little bit different from the arms where the humerus does attach to both. The th you might say, did we tell you that? Yes, we told you that. Yeah, I wrote it right here on page 20 under femur. And I wrote, note, while the humerus of the upper arm articulates with the, the, the radius and ulna, the femur articulates only with the tibia. Okay, patella is this kneecap. And uh, tibia, tibia to your own, so we did all that. Uh, okay, the fibula is the fine bone on the lateral side of the leg. There is, uh, there, and at both ends, there's kind of a bump. The bigger bump is the lateral malleolus. The smaller bump is the head. As far as what the lateral malleolus is, if you feel the rounded bump on the lateral side of your ankle, that's the lateral malleolus. Both the tibia and the fibula attach to the talus bone at the distal end. The tarsal bones of the foot are shown right here in your lab manual, uh, figure uh, 10.9. And there are seven tarsal bones, and I only asked you to learn two of them. The top one is the talus, and the bottom of the foot is the calcaneus or heel bone. And all we said is that the distal end of the uh, uh, tibia and the fibula attach on both sides. Which one is on the medial side? The tibia, because that's the TM, the medial. Which one's on the lateral side? The fibula. So they are what attach on both sides of the uh, talus. The talus is in between the tibia and fibula. As far as the metatarsals, uh, they are identified just like the metacarpals of the hand. Uh, with the big toe, numero uno, number one, and the little toe, number five. And then the phalanges work exactly like the finger bones, uh, the phalanges of the toes. Uh, the big toe just has a proximal and distal phalange. Uh, the, all the other toes have proximal, middle, and distal. But to introduce you to the pelvis, let's turn to page uh, E32. The pelvis is actually made up of two pelvic bones. Right? You have a, a right and a left pelvic bone, or hip bone, or we're going to see that it's actually more pro uh, properly called innominate bones. But you'll notice that while the two pelvic bones attach together at the front, and right where they attach at the front is called the pubic uh, synthesis, term is right here. Sim means together. So the pubic symphysis is where the two pelvic bones join together at the front. You notice that at the back, the two pelvic bones don't touch one another. They both attach to the sacrum. That's the sacrum, that big sacral vertebrae on the back. So at the back, it's not the pelvic bones or pel uh, that join together, but they both attach to the uh, sacrum. 
We wrote that the pelvis consists of a right and left innominate bone. That's their proper name for the pelvic bones, the, the right and left innominate. They are also known as the oscoxy bones. It's probably easier to say and spell innominate than it is oscoxy, but whatever you like. And we wrote that they are fused together at the front of the pubic symphysis. Now, the pelvis articulates with the sacrum at the back uh, and uh, acts to transfer the weight from the vertebral column or torso to the legs. What is the pelvic inlet and what is the pelvic outlet? So I'm holding a, here's a pelvis here. Uh, this is the, this opening here at the top is called the inlet or pelvic brim. And the opening at the bottom, at the bottom is called the outlet. All right, so the inlet and the outlet. This is what goes in the pelvis. This is where it comes out of the pelvis. Uh, so that's what we wrote. Another name for pelvic inlet is brim. And uh, then there's the pelvic uh, outlet. What is the true pelvis uh, and false pelvis? So the true pelvis is where my hand is right now. My hand is in the true pelvis. Yeah, this is kind of gross. Uh, the true pelvis is the area between the pelvic inlet and the pelvic outlet. All right, so right between the inlet and the outlet is the true pelvis. Now, this is the true pelvis where my hand is. You'll notice there's this area above. This is called the false pelvis. This is called the false pelvis or greater pelvis. The true pelvis is also known as the lesser pelvis. So that's what's written right here. Right? We have the uh, so-called uh, false or greater pelvis, and then we have the true or lesser pelvis. The true pelvis or lesser pelvis is the area between the inlet and the outlet. How do you recognize a male from a female? Uh, students have commonly asked me that in terms of any part of the body. Uh, some, uh, I assume that uh, forensic uh, coroners uh, who really know their body well can recognize whether it's a male or female in many different ways. But without a doubt, the easiest part of the body to recognize male from female is the pelvis, because it's uh, the functional differences of a female pelvis compared to a male pelvis. And there are many features about the differences between the male and female pelvis. The easiest one is this angle formed where the two uh, bones, the uh, pelvic bones or innominate bones, join together at the pubic symphysis. If the angle where they, uh, where they join together is less than 90 degrees, it's a male pelvis. If it's greater than 90, it's a female pelvis. So here's, I've got a pelvis right here. This angle is less than 90 degrees. Here's another pelvis and You'll notice this one is greater than 90 degrees. Now, there are many other distinguishing features as well. On the next page, E33, so we've made a list of uh, these other features, and we could summarize them this way. First, notice again these. Angle, less than 90, male pelvis, greater than 90, female pelvis. Uh, in general, the uh, male pelvis is narrower and taller, and in general, the female pelvis is uh, shallower and wider. Each anominate bone, each pelvic bone or anominate bone is itself made up of three bones that have fused together. There is the upper ilium, right, the upper ilium. There is the lower ischium, right here. And there is the pubic bone in the front. So there are really three bones that fuse together to form each anominate bone. And so uh, that's what I've written right here below the picture. Each anominate bone is actually formed from the fusion of an ilium, an ischium, and the pubic bone. So let's start with the ilium. So what is the iliac crest? Okay, the ilium is this flared part of the pelvis, and the crest is the very top. This is the crest. And you can, when you put your hands on your hips, you're basically resting them on the iliac crest. Now, on the very front, on the front side at the top, there's kind of a bump, and that's called the anterior superior iliac spine. And it's written right here. 
and you can probably feel on the front of your pelvis, there's a bump right on the front. That's the anterior superior iliac spine, okay, on the front. Now, there's actually a little bump right below that. Here's where I'm pointing to. So this is the iliac crest. And the anterior superior iliac spine is this really front part. There's also a little, another bump about an inch below the top one called the anterior inferior iliac spine. So where, once you feel the anterior superior, you feel about an inch lower than that, then there's another uh, spine or bump. Uh, here in your lab manual, here they're showing uh, pictures uh, of the, and uh, photographs. And uh, here they're showing all kinds of detailed pictures of the different parts of the pelvis and describing it. So, of course, it's all there. Uh, the next thing that we've written is posterior superior iliac spine and posterior inferior iliac spine. So, on the back side of the pelvis, uh, not quite as easy to see, is a posterior, which means on the back side, superior iliac spine. And again, about an inch below that, posterior inferior. The next thing that's listed is the greater sciatic notch. Uh, what's that? So and this is best seen on the back side of the pelvis. On the back side, there is this notch right here and here. And why that's important is there's a huge nerve that goes right with, through each notch. That's the sciatic nerve. And some people get pain associated with the sciatic nerve. That's called sciatica. So uh, there's a huge nerve. They're each about the size of a thumb that are right in that notch. Uh, all right, and then on page E34, on E34, and incidentally, when I test you on the pelvis, I will test you on a whole pelvis. Uh, in this picture, this is you're looking at one. Here it shows the ilium and the uh, uh, ischium, and the pubic bone, and they all join together. And where they all come together is at the socket where the head of the femur fits in called the acetabulum, uh, which is one of the first terms we gave you when we were learning the femur. The head of the femur uh, fits into this socket called the acetabulum. OK, this is the sciatic notch right here in this picture. And the sacroiliac joint, what's that? OK, well, that's simply where the ilium attaches to the sacrum. OK, on the back side, these are the ilium. This is the sacrum, and there's a joint. Maybe you've heard this expression. People will say, it really hurts there. My old sacroiliac is uh, acting up on me. So, uh, oh, sacroiliac. Um, then we come to the ischium, so that's where I wrote the acetabulum, the socket where the head of the femur pops in. The ischial spine, so again on the back side, uh, if this is the sciatic notch, the ischial spine is right here, this spine sticking out. I realize that it's a little bit hard to see, but it's all in your lab manual, and uh, it's all labeled. In this uh, picture here, this was the sciatic notch. This is the ischial spine right here. And then the ischial tuberosity, that's the very bottom of the pelvis. A tuberosity is a bumpy area right down here at the bottom. This bumpy area at the very bottom are called the ischial tuberosities. Uh, and that's actually what you're sitting on. What you're actually sitting on is the ischial tuberosities of your pelvis. Uh, that's it, right down here at the bottom. And uh, then uh, the pubic bone, uh, the important thing is that at the very front, this is the pubic bone here at the front. And where they come together is called the pubic synthesis. And then we have this pubic arch, this angle. If it's less than 90 degrees, it's a male. And if it's greater than 90, it's a female. Uh, all right, and uh, that we wrote that on E35. And the last item on E35 after pubic arch is obturator foramen. What's that? So right here in the front, there's an opening or hole right here and here. These are called the obturator foramens. Right here. Right here.